Dave Martinson from the American Chemical Society, and uh, this is the second webinar uh, in the series uh, from the Chemical Information Division of ACS. Um, so uh, a little bit about the series. Uh, we wanted to uh, extend uh, some of the, the programming efforts that the program committee does uh, because we know there's a, a lot of SIMF members who aren't able to attend all the meetings. And in fact, at any given meeting, uh, not everybody is able to attend all the sessions. So um, we're uh, looking at bringing timely discussions to a, a broader community than we just we get at the national meetings. Uh, we appreciate any feedback uh, on these seminars, and you can send that to this address, chair at acssymph.org. Um, we are using Adobe Connect as the webinar software. If you're not in full screen mode, then you should see a question box where you can type a, a, a comment or a question. Comment if you're having technical difficulties. Uh, question if you have one for Jean-Claude later on, uh, which we'll uh, uh, give to him during the Q&A session. And uh, we thank you for joining us. Uh, we currently have uh, 12 uh, participants uh, uh, in addition to John Claude and uh, so we'll uh, probably get a few more as time goes on. Uh, oh, a reminder for me, I have already started recording this. Uh, the recording will be available uh, on the SIMF website uh, probably uh, a couple days after the presentation. So uh, we do thank John Claude Bradley for uh, being our webinar speaker today. Uh, he's going to talk on deployment of an app from open data feeds and algorithms uh, recommending recrystallization solvents. And a little bit about John Claude. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of Ottawa, a Bachelor of Science from Laurentian University, and he's uh, currently Associate Professor at, of Chemistry at Drexel University. And listed here are some of his interests and projects. So at this point, I will uh, turn the uh, presenter mode over to John Claude. For the invitation, um, so I'd like to talk about the uh, deployment of an app uh, from open data feeds and algorithms uh, that basically focus on something relatively recently that uh, we've done. Uh, a lot of what you'll see is uh, coded by Andrew Lang from Oral Roberts University, and uh, we also collaborated with uh, Tony Williams especially with relation to some of the ChemSpider things I'll be discussing. So the main application here is uh, an app to recommend recrystallization. So I will talk about a, an app that can run on either um, a smartphone or on a laptop, you know, whatever is convenient for, for the chemist. So uh, let me talk a little bit about why this is important. Uh, so if you're an organic chemist, recrystallization is generally the preferred way of purifying a solid compound um, but some of the limitations are that you actually need to know from someone who's done it previously what the magic solvent and uh, conditions are and that is what we're trying to fix here we're trying to turn that into a rational process so that the app can actually give you some suggestions as to a solvent that you could use and uh, currently there's still not really um, some rational Project, some rational approaches that are available. So one of the main uh, improvements, uh, one, one of the main advantages of recrystallization is that it scales much more easily and cheaply than chromatography. So if you're, you know, doing a reaction on the gram scale, then typically a cr chromatography will be your, your go-to technology because it, it works pretty much every time. However, um, it's very, very difficult to scale cheaply. So the app looks like this. Um, you can access it through uh, this URL, xtelapp.wikispaces.com. And uh, it has actually a number of additional uh, services, such as melting point, uh, log P, or MSDS sheets. But I will focus mainly on the recrystallization here. When you click on that link, it basically uh, defaults to these parameters. And you simply type in the um, compound with whatever convenient identifier you have. In this case, we're showing benzoic acid. You can also put a chem splatter ID, you can put a smiles, whatever is most convenient for the uh, compound at hand. 
and we default to a minimum solvent boiling point of 60 Celsius and a maximum of 80, a minimum percent yield of 80. And something that's actually, uh, we found out is actually much more important that we realize is the minimum concentration at boiling. So uh, we want to set this fairly high uh, because if, if it's too low, even though the recrystallization yield theoretically would be um, high, if you have a very dilute solution, then it's very difficult to, to do a practical recrystallization. And it also wastes a lot of solvents. So we've set these and the endpoint temperature can be changed. It defaults to 25 Celsius, but another convenient uh, temperature would be like zero, uh, where you just put it in, in an ice bath. So if we just run this example, we get uh, four hits, four solvents, uh, one chlorobutane and two ethanol water mixtures and carbon tetrachloride. So this is actually pretty interesting because if you look at the literature, uh, ethanol water mixtures have been used pretty often to recrystallize benzoic acid, but there hasn't been a mention of one chlorobutane or carbon tetrachloride that we could find. And there actually could be an advantage because if you're doing a recrystallization, you might want to avoid water if at all possible because it's difficult to uh, dry. But uh, this app suggests carbon tetrachloride that we hadn't seen and we actually uh, tried to use it as a recrystallization solvent and it worked very well. So. The initial feedback we're getting from this is that it's, it's working out pretty well with the solutes um, that we've been testing it with. Now, if you click on one of these solvents, it will actually give you a uh, predicted solubility temperature curve. And as you'll see, this actually uses the melting point information. And uh, so you can see that you know if you go from boiling to 25, that's where the recrystallization yield comes in. But you could quickly see what would happen, for example, if you were to cool it to zero degrees you get an extra bump in the, in the recrystallization yield. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of an, inter an interactive kind of app where you can use the information as it's given, but you can also play with it. And as I mentioned before, uh, you can also, if you hit the melting point feature of this app, you can get an experimental and a predicted number. All right, so let's go into how this actually works. So the first step is uh, to look up the solvent boiling point. And this is actually pretty easy. We have uh, about 100 solvents that we consider uh, for recrystallization. And so all of these all these boiling points are listed, so that's not a problem. Second step, if you look at the room temperature solubility of your solutes, and that's a little bit more problematic. We do have a pretty good collection right now, but if we don't have it, then the app will actually predict the room temperature solubility using an Abraham uh, descriptor model. So that's something I won't have time to go into detail, but we, we use the Abraham solubility model extensively in all of our applications here. And we can even predict the Abraham descriptors based on the CDK, which as you'll see has an advantage because it uh, produces open data and it's, it's open source software. Then we need to look up the uh, solute melting point. And again, we have a pretty good collection of these, but if it's not available, then we predict it again using CDK descriptors. Uh, number four, we use the melting point and the solubility at room temperature to predict the solubility at the boiling point of the solvent. As I showed you previously, that's, that's what we generate the temperature solubility curve. And with all of these numbers, we finally calculated the predicted recrystallization yield. There's a lot going on here, and I want to make the point in this presentation that there's a huge advantage to using open uh, collections of data and open models uh, to be able to quickly uh, move forward with, the, with these kinds of applications and have other people use them. Okay, so we, we're using open solubility collections. The models are open. We're using uh, melting point, open melting point collections, and all of our modeling, we try to make it as transparent as possible so that it's reproducible. Um, we try to use the CDK as much as possible. And finally, for um, melting points or solubilities that we cannot find that we'd like to measure, those will actually be recorded using Open Notebook Science. And I'll show you a couple of quick examples of that. So why is it important uh, to use open collection? Well, basically, uh, everything that we do, every step, and I showed you there's, there's actually five steps for the recrystallization uh, solvent prediction. And that's actually a whole bunch of different services that are mashed together uh, behind the scenes. But each, in, each individual process can actually be accessed and, and evaluated and used for other purposes. And we want to produce open data 
from this app. And the only way we can do that is if every single collection is open data. So we, we essentially have to use open data collections because if we were to use proprietary collections, uh, it would stop us ultimately from uh, giving data out as open data. And we want a transparent chain of providence with all of the all the transformations that we're doing, the mash the mashups, everything to be uh, transparent as well. An example of this would be our collection of open melting point data sets. So we currently have about 20,000 compounds, uh, 27,000 uh, individual melting points to this, these collections. And you can see here in full detail, you know, how where we got the data from, what we did to it. And uh, all of these are, you know, freely downloadable and they're all open data collections. So this is important because it's often hard to tell from the literature if people have processed um, data sources exactly what they did. So we make this as explicit as possible and try to give, you know, as much feedback about exactly what uh, transformations that, that we did. So these would be uh, for the melting points. Just to give you an idea of, you know, why it, it, this can actually be quite challenging to validate if you want more, uh, melting points. This is something that I didn't realize until we got involved with this project of how difficult it is to evaluate. Um, here's an example for benzyl toluene. So what we did here is we, we collected as many different data sources as possible, and there are six in total. So this includes, you know, searching on commercial databases, searching the web, searching vendor catalogs, everything. And we end up here with a scenario where there's not a, an, an obvious convergence. So we have melting points from minus 30 all the way to plus 125 Celsius. So in this particular case, we can't uh, reel out any data points because there's not an obvious convergence. And so this is a situation where we have no choice but to actually order the compound and actually measure it ourselves. And this is where open notebook science comes in, where basically where my students are, are doing something even as ostensibly simple as, me as measuring a melting point, uh, the details are actually turn out to be very important as to how this is actually done. And especially for melting points, this information is rarely provided. I mean, you even don't generally get um, proof of purity for melting point reports. You just sort of have to assume that the compounds were pure enough, that the techniques they used, you know, were um, were good enough to 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 give the numbers that they're reporting. So with using uh, Open Notebook Science, all of that is actually going to be made explicit. So essentially what this means is that we have a lab notebook for whatever purpose, whether it's measuring melting points or reactions, all of that. Uh, we basically make that public and it's done within, uh, you know, by the end of the day when the, the student actually did the experiment. So in this particular example, trying to resolve the melting point of 4 benzyl toluene, we ordered the compound and it was shipped as a liquid. And so immediately we could rule out any of the reports uh, that were above room temperature. So the 125, the 97.5. Uh, and we actually, you know, got an NMR to confirm that it was in fact the right compound and that it was pure. And all of that is actually recorded in the lab notebook. And this is an example of the lab notebook page where we're measuring a melting point. And you have a log section down there that basically records minute by minute what the student did and what the student observed. And so when we make statements about what we think the melting point is, you can dig in and, and actually investigate why we're making those statements. So, as I mentioned, um, we basically uh, saw that the compound was a liquid. And then if you look at the lab notebook, we put it in a freezer for two days. So the freezer was at minus 15 Celsius. And it did not freeze after two days. So at this point, we, uh, we basically flagged all of the melting points in red here. So the 5, 125, 4.58, 97.5. And so we never delete any data in our collections, whether it be the solubility or the melting points. Instead, we basically we keep them in there in the database, but we flag them in this, in the, in this display in red so that they don't contribute to the average of the melting point. And here you can see the reasons for that, right? The notes from one to four does not, so, does not solidify at minus 15 for two days. And then there's a link to the lab, note, uh, lab notebook page so that you can see exactly how we, uh, we, we did that. 
So this was the best information we had at the time, and we basically uh, marked these as, as outliers. Now, what happened is I, when I, I gave a talk, when I came back, uh, after 16 days, the uh, compound actually was frozen. So we have to revise what our assumptions are in this case. And so now we actually uh, removed from the outlier marking the plus five uh, from, from three different sources here. And one of these sources, when we actually did a careful melting point measurement by letting it heat slowly over the course of an afternoon, we were able, in fact, to reproduce the plus five Celsius number. So now we revise this, and now we're actually fairly confident that the true value is actually pretty close to plus five. So this is just basically an example of how you know difficult it actually can be to validate some of these uh, melting points and you know even the solubility measurements. So the point here is that you know, we tend to think about facts in chemistry. At least a lot of the students, when they're learning chemistry, tend to think about that. What you know? What are the facts? What is the melting point of this compound? But really, there are no facts. There are only measurements embedded within assumptions. And unfortunately, if you just look up a melting point in the literature, there are very, very few explicit assumptions that are made. There's just a number reported. So one of the advantages of using open notebook science in this context is that you can basically follow exactly what uh, observations were uh, used to make, state, to make conclusions about the melting point or any other uh, property information. So with, with these collections and being able to look at subcollections where the, the spread, for example, is not greater than five degrees and we have multiple sources, uh, with, and, with Andy Lang, uh, we were able to create these pretty good models for uh, melting points for compounds that uh, are commonly used. And uh, this melting point model compares favorably with previous melting point models with the huge advantage that it uses the CDK. So it's a completely transparent model, and all of the descriptors uh, are basically not from proprietary software. So again, for the reasons I mentioned previously, we think that's a huge advantage. Now, I talked about the recrystallization uh, app, but of course, those that basically is, is, the, is the sum and the mashup of a whole bunch of components. Each one of these components separately is also accessible to anyone. So we have a melting point prediction service, and this you know uses the melting point uh, model that I, I just showed in the previous slide. And you can see here for benzoic acid, we have a whole bunch of values that are very close to 122, and the prediction is 108. So in cases where we don't have as many experimental values, the prediction can actually turn out to be important. And we have all kinds of different ways of communicating information. Here, for example, there's a URL where you can just type solute equals. In this case, it's vanillin. If you change that to benzoic acid, it's a very convenient way to send someone a link. And this is a dynamic link. So if any of these, uh, if there's new solubility measurements that are done today, for example, they will be included when you check this tomorrow. And so this is uh, a convenient way to find out what are all the different measurements and all the different solvents for a particular solute. And another way that uh, has been pretty convenient for us in the past year is to uh, use Google App Scripts to uh, report these numbers. So this is basically using a, a regular Google spreadsheet that we've modified by having the, uh, the Google App Scripts that are specific to some chemistry functions here. And so just to give you an example, let's say that we want to get the melting point. Right? We have all of our compounds um, that you would just simply type you know, vanillin or benzoic acid. And then you would just hit a, a cell and you would say, I want the melting point for this. So you hit the drop down G-O-N-S, hit get melting point. And then after you uh, you hit that drop down, you simply point to the name of the compound and it'll get you, you know, 113 degrees in this case immediately. So this is a really nice way to basically uh, do reaction uh, planning or any kind of analysis um, without having to leave the Google spreadsheet environment. And this is useful definitely for planning and reporting reactions, because of course these Google spreadsheets can be as wide as you want and can have as many links that are essential for the analysis of the reaction. In this case, right, if we, this is just scroll to the right from this, this sheet, there's a column for view the NMR. And so you simply click on that link 
and it will take you to the NMR of either a starting material or a product that you're trying to make. And this is using uh, the JCAMP DX format for NMRs, which is open, which is very nice. And it uses uh, some Ken Doodle tools to basically display. And if you're familiar with this, right, you can simply take your uh, mouse and you can uh, drag it across one of these peaks and it will zoom in full detail. So you can see, for example, impurities or you can get uh, coupling constants, whatever it is that you want. So this is actually, you know, even if you don't want to work openly, this is actually a super useful uh, tool for organic chemists. So you don't have to uh, print out 15 different expansions to get your coupling constants and whatnot. So here's a quick application of, you know, how can you use Google Spreadsheet, not necessarily for reaction planning, but let's say that you wanted to analyze the relationship between um, straight chain alcohols and their melting points. So if you have a Google spreadsheet and you, you have these functions, right, you can just hit the drop down menu. Well, you can basically just type methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol. There are functions for generating the image that you see on the left. There's another Google app script that'll give you the smiles. Another one will give you the chemist spider ID, everything that you see here. And it quickly gives you the, uh, the melting points for the experimental and the predicted, if you want as well, of all of these different uh, straight chain alcohols. And then there's a link here at the right-hand side of this uh, table. It says uh, the, it's the melting point link. So when you click on that, it will open up this window that you see on the right, right? For, so I basically clicked on the ethanol link, and it shows you where the number comes from, where that minus 114.13 comes from. You can see that this is actually a pretty reliable number because there's about eight entries that are very, very close to minus 114, but in addition, because we never delete anything, you can see there's two outliers, one at minus 144 and one at minus 130. And because they're marked in red, one of us has gone in here and actually decided that these are outliers and we've marked them. Now you may decide that you want to include them and that's why we never delete anything because all the information, uh, it's basically just your, uh, you set your own threshold as, as to what you think are outliers and what are not. So we decided these are outliers and uh, that's where that number comes from. So why is this important? Well, let's say that you want to look at some other series. Um, for example, the melting point dependence on the chain length for carboxylic acids. Well, you can see here that there is a zigzag pattern and it turns out that uh, the five carbon carboxylic acid has the lowest melting point of all. And then we have a model that's in red and you can see that it also reflects the zigzag pattern. Well, how do we know that zigzag pattern is real or if it's basically just because of the inherent error in, in each number? Well, because we've used the, this uh, spreadsheet, we can quickly see how many, uh, how many values are close to each other. And if we set a threshold, let's say, I'm going to look at all triple validated measurements. And what I mean by that is that we have three or more values that are within five degrees of each other. And if that's the case, we're going to put it on the plot. And it turns out that for straight chain carboxylic acids from 1 to 10, we actually have that scenario. We have uh, triple validated numbers. So that means that when we look at this plot, we can be fairly confident that this is real. If we look at the straight chain alcohols, the uh, little chart on the bottom, again, you don't see so much of a zigzag pattern, but you get a minimum at three carbons, which is a little surprising if you haven't looked at these data sets before. But because we uh, can confirm that these are triple validated, we know that we're not chasing our tail here, that in fact the model is uh, reflecting what's, what's real. Now here's a scenario which is quite different. Let's say we look at uh, cyclic primary amines from three to six carbons. Of course we can generate a plot, but when you click on the value for the four carbons or the cyclobutyl amine, you see that there is, it's not triple validated at all. In fact, there's only one value that we can get from anywhere, and it's minus four Celsius. Now, so the fact that it's actually quite different from the predicted value, in this case, I wouldn't take that too seriously because it's quite possible that that melting point for cyclobutylamine in the literature is wrong. And so because we can't get any additional references for this, we have no choice but to measure its actual melting point and try to resolve it. So this is basically how, how you can use this, this kind of uh, approach 
using these Google Apps scripts to very, very quickly get some confidence about your numbers. So here's an example where in Wikipedia, right, there's a under the Alkane page, there is a, a, a series of uh, melting points with increasing number of carbons for alkanes. And again, this would be extremely difficult to do if you didn't have a tool like this. But if we actually do this, we find that there is an error for the melting point of ethane. It's listed as minus 172. But then when we click on all the values that we have for the melting point of ethane, the minus 172 is there, but there's only two reports of this versus five reports very close to minus 183. So again, it's a judgment call based on this information. We're marking the minus 172 and the minus 172.15 as being outliers. And that's why we feel that the value is much closer to minus 183. And we've been working with Martin Walker to basically try to put these values in the supplementary section of Wikipedia. So uh, just going real quick here, because I think we're running a little low on time, but the you know, you can also um, do the same thing for synthesis information. So in my group, we're trying to make dibenzylacetone derivatives uh, because we have, there are some of these compounds that uh, appear to dock against the, pathly, the, the pathotaxel site for tubulin. And these are two syntheses for, for compounds that, you know, scored pretty high in that docking run. And, uh, you know, you think if the compound's been made before, it would be kind of trivial to actually try to remake it. The top compound actually didn't get any hits, so it wasn't synthesized previously. But the naphthol derivative at the bottom here has been made. And this is just to show you, you know, how much information is actually missing from the chemical literature. This one example here, they in fact did make the uh, naphthol derivative but they didn't specify how much ethanol was added to dissolve the sodium hydroxide. And that actually turns out to be critical because if you don't know that, it's going to change the kinetics pretty dramatically. And sodium hydroxide is not very soluble in ethanol, so that's actually a pretty big unknown that would make it difficult to reproduce. And there's also no NMR given for this uh, particular synthesis. Another uh, synthesis from a paper just says, they refer to an organic synthesis paper, but it, that that particular organic synthesis paper is very good, but it's not for this compound. It's for the benzaldehyde derivative, not the naphthaldehyde derivative. And so that really doesn't help us. And so these are just sort of examples of, of how there's a lot of information missing. Now with the open notebooks, of course, we have not only all the information for the successful reactions, but we also keep track of all the unsuccessful reactions. So in this particular case, all right, we have a, an interface here that uh, you know can enable us to search all of our lab notebooks and also some literature that is associated with these experiments. And we find that about 90% of these reactions are actually not successful but still have useful information. So if we do a search for, I want all the reactions with acetone, aldol condensation, then we end up with this is an example of a failed experiment where my student Matthew McBride here tried to react acetone with benzaldehyde, and it was not successful. And it turns out the reason for that, if you look at the ethanol water mixture is one to six, look at the log of this particular experiment, at 1341, the solution was observed to separate into two layers. So that means that there was a solubility problem with the benzaldehyde. When this reaction was uh, rerun, now with a one to one ethanol water, it worked perfectly. And that information, if anyone wants to work in this particular chemical space, or, you know, try to do this reaction with uh, compounds that are analogous to these, all, this, all the information about what didn't work is actually very important. And you can see here the uh, phenanthrene derivative that had never been synthesized, it actually worked, but it took quite a bit of trial and error, and all that trial and error is available in our database here. So finally, I basically like to uh, try to cover what I've been doing for my teaching to try to improve these uh, data collections. So every fall, I teach chemical information retrieval. And one of the assignments that the students have is to find properties for specific compounds. Now this year, um, what I've done is I've given a list of compounds for students to actually curate, or well, basically to find properties from literature. And they're doing it based on the melting point outliers and the solubility outliers that we have from our models. 
So the idea here is the students have to do this assignment anyway, so why not have them do something productive to try to, um, you know, improve the, the uh, collection of, of properties we have. So they basically click on one of these links. Here's an example where uh, this is the melting point outlier list. So uh, we have, uh, you know, dihydro, dihydroxy biphenyl. The student basically puts their name to reserve this compound to make sure we don't uh, get a duplicate in the class. And then there are links to all the information we already have about these compounds and they can't use a redundant value. So they have to actually to find an, an, an additional value um, that is not identical to one previously found, no matter what the source. Here's an example of a melting point outlier. There's only one report of a melting point from FizzProp of 145.5. Our model predicts minus 25. And so basically, you know, the, the student who picked this would find all the different melting points for this compound. And hopefully we would see a convergence and we'd then be able to uh, rectify this. And then when we rerun the model, hopefully that will improve its performance. Same thing with the solubility. Uh, some of these are actually pretty surprising because they're so common, right? Benzoic acid and one octanol. Well, this is flagged because we have a, a, multi, a solubility range between 0.1 and 1.6 molar. And when you look at it, it's actually a little tricky because it's not like there's one outlier, right? The 0.1122 value is clearly an outlier, but then, you know, you seem to have two uh, populations around 0.9 and around, around 1.5. So again, this is a very iterative uh, process, and we have to do more work to resolve it. Now, speaking of ChemSpider, we've used it pretty extensively in this course. Uh, and one of the things that uh, is a huge problem in these in these data sets is oftentimes the theory of chemistry is not specified. And the problem with that is that uh, if you have a racemic mixture versus a pure enantiomer, the melting point will be different substantially. And so with these collections, we're only interested in pure compounds. And so we want to actually get the information for a specific enantiomer. In this case, ibuprofen, right, was listed, was flagged as one of the compounds with a problematic melting point. And you can see here by, by hitting the ChemSpider ID, it says zero out of one defined stereocenters. And so one of the tasks that the students has to do is to find either one or both enantiomers for ibuprofen, and then make sure that when they're looking at properties that it's only for one of the enantiomers. And we can do that pretty straightforwardly with uh, ChemSpider. So if we go back here, right, they find the uh, ibuprofen with undefined stereochemistry. All you have to do is hit the smiles at Inchi link, and then copy the left-hand side of the Inchi key to find all of the different uh, stereo isomers that are present and then select one that where all the stereo centers are defined. So that's been pretty handy use of uh, ChemSpider. And then the students basically collect all this information and put it into this chemical information validation sheet, which I verify by the end of the term. And this term will collect about a thousand properties that should help with the improvement of our model. One of the things is that we, we basically operate with a no trust philosophy here. So students actually have to take a picture of the molecule to prove that not only it's the right compound, but it's the right, the right stereoisomer. And then they basically have to show in the image the property, let's say in this case melting point. Uh, they have to show the actual uh, numbers, 148 to 150, and then the units. And the units is a whole other uh, problem in the literature, uh, where oftentimes it'll just say degrees, and won't say uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit, and so but that's why it's so important to actually have the image to make sure that we are not going by the student's interpretation, but the actual original data. And then of course, um, we have these links that I showed before. It lists all of the different uh, properties and values that we have for the compound. So going forward, we want to extend what we've been doing with melting points and uh, solubilities to all kinds of, of uh, chemical properties. And this project uh, is called the Open Chemical Property Matrix, and it's available at ocpm.wikispaces.com. And what we're doing here is we're collecting all kinds of chemical properties, and we are uh, looking at different models that are available in the literature. So there's a link here, list of equations and property definitions. Here's a snapshot of that. So we have, we're basically collecting equations from the literature 
that you know may be apl applicable to only a small chemical space, but we're listing them all anyway, and we're evaluating them in a larger chemical space to find out if they are more broadly applicable than the authors originally intended, or if they actually fail and are not that useful. Here's an example of how we do this comparison. Uh, here is a spreadsheet for only for melting points. So we have a collection here of molecules with known melting points, and then we compare each individual model that we've listed uh, that we've collected from literature, including our own here, which is the ONS melting point model. And we analyze the performance of the model within that with that particular data set. And uh, so I have a student, uh, Kayla Gavardi, who's actually doing that systematically going through all of these equations. And I think that, you know, what we did in terms of, you know, giving uh, web services for melting point solubility, we can do the same for log P, for boiling point, all of these other properties um, automatically. So we also want to be able to predict properties for Virtual libraries of compounds, for example, here we have dibenzylacetone uh, libraries. They have all kinds of different applications, antioxidant, anti-cancer, malaria, et cetera. And so we'd like to be able to identify compounds from, this, from these virtual libraries that would have useful applications via uh, the OCPM uh, project. And so that's basically it. Um, I think I, I tried to show that more openness in chemistry it makes science more efficient, especially when, you know, it's not that obvious what the melting point of a compound is. And uh, it's important to provide interfaces that make sense to the end users. So for the chemists of the bench, you want to give them something like a recrystallization app where they don't have to know the math behind it. They don't have to understand how it works necessarily. But if you're a modeler or if you want to dig into exactly how these, uh, how these models are put together and what the, the uh, data collections are, that should also be available uh, for computational chemists. And so I think you've got to focus on both, and, and that way you can have some useful applications. So that uh, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jean-Claude, for that interesting presentation. Uh, I hope you can hear the virtual applause uh, <laughs> now from the, the people in the audience. Um, yeah, I can hear it. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there any questions that uh, uh, the people that, uh, on the other end would uh, have for John Claude? Well, while while people are typing, I have one. Uh, you talked about the Google Apps, and I was wondering if uh, those actually run in the in the Google Cloud or if they're uh, run on the local uh, device. Or a computer? No, they don't run on the local machine at all. I mean, basically, uh, it's it's sort of like the uh, Visual Basic for Excel. It's kind of the equivalent of that. But what it does is it basically calls web services that are on, like, we have a server or a Roberts University. We have a we have a couple of servers at Drexel. So what it's basically doing is it's defining the functions, and then it is actually going out on the web and hitting those uh, those particular web services. So okay. those so are available. Not, What's that? So it's not running within the, the Google spreadsheet. It's actually going out to a different server where the, the app is running. Well, actually, I'm not sure if that the, the specific code that hits the web service, uh, I'm not sure if it's running on the Google servers or on the machine. I, 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 I don't know. I think it might be running on the, on the Google servers because you can't refresh it from your own machine, like for example, if you do calculation and it throws an error, you you don't actually have the means of refreshing it. So it you know it's probably running on their servers. Okay, uh, we have a couple other questions. Uh, one from Bruce Slutsky. I'm concerned that 90% of all reactions in open notebooks are not successful. Can false data be assumed as true? Well, that's just our experience with our particular projects, and I think it's not that different than you know when I was a grad student. <laughs> Yeah, probably you know ninety percent of them aren't successful, in the sense that you have you know an actual isolated yield and a fully characterized product. A lot of those reactions are actually in progress, or you know that you you got um, the reaction work but you didn't get a precipitate, things like that. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's common. That's one of the things actually that's that's a useful. Um, way of using open notebook science is that you can compare these things. You could compare between two different groups. 
if their you know ratio of successful to unsuccessful is is the same. I don't know because these things aren't measured traditionally. So, bottom line is that uh, if, if I understand the, the the nature of the question, does that mean that the ninety percent are not true? Well, we're not. We're actually stating that we've done those reactions. I mean, if they failed or if they they stalled at some point, uh, everything we report is as true as we can make it. Um, so if you, you know, you could actually analyze it to see where it went wrong, or there might be some partial positive information you can get for that for your application. So even though it was a failure in our hands, there might be some partial steps in there that could be, you know, useful for someone else. Okay, uh, a question from Tony Williams. How many of your students end up participating in the curation work, and how would you rate their participation? Do they enjoy it? Are they surprised by data quality issues? What do they get out of it? Well, if, I mean, there's there's two populations of students here. There's the students that are working in my lab, so those are you know volunteer students, uh, and they would actually do experiments if necessary. But the, the very last part of my presentation, where I talked about my class, I have about thirty students in there, and uh, yeah, I mean, the one thing they learn is how unreliable the chemical literature is. I think that's that's surprising to a lot of them, and that's the main point of why I teach that course. Like anything else, some enjoy it, some don't. Um, because their work is public, of course, they are not required to use their real names, so they can use a pseudonym if they want to, although they almost never do. So presumably, they don't have a problem with doing that kind of work. Um, I don't know if they all enjoy it or not. They're graded on it, but uh, you know, some do, and I'm sure some, some don't. But uh, it's no different than any other assignment that they'd have to do anyway. But I don't know how much I don't know how many enjoy it actually. Maybe a follow-up question on that. Do you have a, a feel for uh, whether it, there is a mechanism or wh whether any students are interested in continuing on with the open notebook work once the course is over? Yeah, I have had that happen. Where students continue on after and uh, you know start doing solubility measurements or, or melting points. Yeah, absolutely, that that, that does happen. Um, with, with a few who have, who have interest in that, sure. Yep. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. So if you could give control back to me, okay. Jean Claude. So that for more information about the division of chemical information, there's a website that you can go to. Uh, if you're interested in joining, uh, there's a brochure that you can find out there with information on that. And uh, thank, a big thanks to John Claude for the presentation today, and uh, thanks to all who joined us as well. So uh, again.